Hi, my name is Kevin, and joining me is uh, Stefano. We are with, uh, or we work for RSA. We do incident response, and we're going to talk about incident response in a heterogeneous environment. <clears throat> so the investigation process, uh, we're primarily talking about triage. And this is going to be the key to solving what the actor is doing inside your network and then finding machines that the actor has touched. But one of the major problems with most um, networks is we have multiple different OSs inside the network. So we'll have Linux, we'll have Windows, <clears throat> may have Solaris, AIX, and trying to find tools that can search all of those OS's and pick out the artifacts that we're looking for um, is, is few and far between. <clears throat> our goal for our triage is to identify any artifacts and any unusual technologies that, uh, um, that the actors are using. Also, too, is one of the problems is, is having a single tool across all those um, types of devices is pretty hard to come by, as well as searching that environment for the IOCs that we do develop over time with the findings that we have. <clears throat> the last problem we have is pinpointing the known badness uh, within all of our OSs, um, which allows us for easier mitigation. So in our approach, we want to take all the IOCs that play an important role in our investigation and have a single solution where I can touch every single machine on my network and find <clears throat> any known indicators of compromise. <coughs> The uh, traditional IR approach is uh, in regards to IOCs as context. So generally we get an IP address, we get MD5, and we're told to go search for that. But we have no idea where that information has come from. If you're on some of the government uh, lists where you get um, indicators of compromise, you're not 100% sure where those indicators are coming from. The application of IOCs uh, to the environment is often role-based. Um, it's not behavioral-based. And the customize, customization of the IOCs <clears throat> in most of the commercial products is, is not an option. We, we, you know, if we have McAfee, for example, the AV scanner, we just can't uh, go and develop signatures for it for the most part. So the other thing is we have role-based detection. And a lot of times these tools will miss changes that the actor has made. So if the actor changes one or two bytes, MD5 hashes no longer work. Um, you know, it just depends on what's all being changed by the actors. <clears throat> so our idea to help address this issue is we know that production of code always leaves traces in any binary. So there's going to be certain libraries, there's going to be certain pieces of text in each of the binaries that we're going to be able to look for. Some of the binaries may contain debugging symbols. Um, so if you get lucky to have that, you have a lot of potential information within the binary. And oftentimes a lot of the attacker's tools only use certain libraries or certain functions uh, that we can search for. <clears throat> a lot of the fingerprinting can be done with software, and, and this is going to be real useful for our IR analysis. Combining the information of both uh, can help solve the attribution problem, so we want to uh, you know, make sure we're helping the assessment of the risk, identifying the end goals of the actors, and create actionable IOCs that aren't disposable. As, as we know, IOCs are only good for X amount of days or weeks. So we want to have something that's going to be good for something that's a longer period of time than just, uh, you know, 20 days. <clears throat> 
one of the tools that I developed uh, to, to help um, when we do triage and mitigation. Uh, this first tool is called RIF, Retrieve Interesting Files Tool. And, and basically it takes a file um, that has a, it's a regex lex, a list. The next slide will show that. But we're going to be able to grab those files forensically from a machine. You use a sleuth kit to grab those files. It's going to output the files into a directory. So it starts off with a, um, the directory of the machine and then it recreates the whole directory structure and puts those files in to wherever we, we tell it that's not part of the, uh, the drive that we're looking at. <clears throat> so initially, you know, we can use this tool and have everything either saved to a remote share or a USB. Um, uh, just turn all these pointer on. So in here, this is this is all it takes to run the tool, as long as everything is in the directory that uh, um, was located on the remote share. For example, this is how we run it. If you guys are interested in the project, this is where you can go to uh, download it. <clears throat> So this is a small sample of some of the artifacts that we're going to grab when we're doing triage on the machines. And when I say triage, I'm not talking five machines or 10 machines. I'm talking 20,000 to 100,000, 200,000 machines. So we're going to grab a whole bunch of files and we're going to go through them looking for IOCs. <clears throat> now FRAC, is uh, the forensics response acquisition. And what this is, is basically uh, allows us to run Rift over the network. So Rift is, was originally created so I can, so I can give it to uh, Johnny, desktop admin, go get me files from a single machine. This one allows me to do it across the network. Uh, I have uh, built in there a cmd.txt, which has several examples of pre Preconfigured examples of using it to using Rift to grab files. Uh, we use uh, PA exec or SSH if we're or SSH pass if it's a Linux box. Uh, it does require admin rights and it does require a remote share. So as long as whatever machine you're connecting it to can mount uh, the remote share, you're golden. <coughs> it supports single IP. Uh, CIDR notation and IP range. And uh, just to, this is what it looks like to run. We have our IP list. So, you know, one of these examples from here. We have the example command text that we want it to run. And verbose if we just want um, to see um, what, what's going on with it. Down here in these two boxes here, we have a Windows example, PA exec. I did try to get this to work. Well, it does work with PS exec, but the problem is, is that a user uh, will see that it's running. I, I know you can say hide the window and all that, but they can go in the task list and, and kill the process. With PA exec, it's a little harder for a user to come in and start killing your processes when you're trying to retrieve data. Um, in here, there's a config file that pulls in the admin and admin password. Here's where it's going to mount the share drive. Um, and then we get into CD into our save share drive, run Rift, and then we remove the share. So connects, mounts the drive, runs Rift, grabs the files we need, disconnects the share, and then exits. So for the most part, there's, there's nothing that, uh, there's a little bit that changes on the machine, but uh, we don't do a whole lot of um, changes to the machine. This is a Unix example <clears throat> using SSH pass. And, and this is what the output of the tool looks like. So here I have machine A. So it, it does resolve the host name. Uh, we have the date and time that the directory was created. And then here, is a list of the files that, 
it retrieved. Now this is a Unix example versus a uh, Windows example, but you know I've asked for all of Etsy to be retrieved. Um, there's information from home that I want, like .ssh, bash history, .b, uh, bash. Um, uh, uh, anyways, um, and then opt root information. Yeah. Uh, Get files is going to contain all of the files retrieved as well as the inode numbers if for whatever reason when you're doing forensics if you need it and because the tool does use sleuth kit we have the fls output so now we have all our timestamps i don't have to go through and parse anything i have it all right here in uh, ascii format I think you hear me well. So, first, apologize for my spaghetti English. Um, anyway, actionable biases are one of the items where we focus our investigation, uh, or, me or to be precise, our methodology. So, what, what it means? Basically, we have in time developed a knowledge base that is actionable in the way that normally uh, integrate it in, inside not just atomic IOCs, but we integrate uh, gener generalized IOCs coming from the atomic IOCs. So normally we create IOCs for the, ob for the purpose of uh, resolving an incident in, a, in an environment, but we don't normally destroy the, or, or forget about these uh, IOCs. We tend to integrate them. We tend to understand uh, the commonalities between different situations uh, related to the same attacker. So from that perspective, uh, we have at this point a number of different ICs that try to integrate in a single set of expressions the entire set of the tools that the attacker use. And from that perspective, it pays well, not much into the searching uh, part, but more into the attribution part. That is one of the most important aspects during the investigation, the IR investigation. Um, so basically, the, the procedure, the, the, the methodology is a set of procedure that we utilize analysis, evidences, in a methodical approach. So we don't just say, okay, we have these, these, and these systems uh, touched by the attacker, but we also try to figure out the commonality between this environment and another customer we have investigated in the past related to potentially the same type of attacker or even the same exact APT group. So this, thanks to this, when we arrange the mitigation and we will still in the process of resolving the incident during the investigation, knowing who, who is the attacker, we can figure out well uh, how to put our nose into first to go continue looking into, into the, the situation. So the database creation, the knowledge base creation is one of the most important aspects of the uh, actionable IOC's methodology. The other is obviously the commitment to continue to integrate things into the database. Um, the central part of our methodology for the actionable IOCs come from the malware analysis. I am the focal point in RSA uh, IR team for the malware analysis. I normally tend to check also the work of the others. And from this exact situation that runs every engagement, we have been able to centralize on me the creation of these actionable IOCs knowledge base. And thanks to this, basically, I normally collect the atomic IOCs from the other analysts, the other IR groups, uh, and I tend to verify by comparison, by analysis, by um, debugging, by disassembling, if we have the chance to expand our knowledge base for that particular type of attacker. One example, uh, uh, sorry, so one example is uh, Poison Ivy. Uh, everybody in the IR field knows Poison Ivy. Uh, it's even 
not really an APT-related tool, more a cyber criminal tool, but in the past, you know, APT groups tend also to, to use what is reliable. And, and a poison ivy was reliable rat. I mean, definitely one of the most well-coded in the past. And uh, up to the 2013, uh, many attackers were using uh, poison ivy. Obviously, it's difficult from that perspective to consider poison ivy analysis able to define one specific APT group. Many use it, it's like Mimikatz. You can't attribute by looking and, and finding Mimikatz in the system who is behind this attack, obviously. But in the end, between 2013 and 2014, the interest of the collectivities <laughs> related to the attacks tends to do discard a poison ivy. Uh, well, in recent days, I mean, two years ago, we started to notice, again, poison ivy coming, in specific in the uh, Asian area, and for specific attackers of that, time, of that place. So, in this case, uh, the, the source code, uh, especially the variant of poison ivy, were using HTTPS transmission, and were able to sneak through proxies something that the original poison ivy was not able to. So by looking at this, by looking at the content into, by looking at all the Yara rules already generated in the past by other researchers, we have been able to generate a single Yara that ruled them all. And from that perspective now, having that, having specific items related to this particular type of variant, we can easily start to understand uh, what is behind the use of poison ivy in an environment. Um, I don't think it's important to go into the detail of poison ivy, oh, sorry, of the yarrow roof poison ivy, but this is much for posterity, for you guys to see, okay, this is, the first part is the latest part, the second part is a string of ma matching the old version of, of uh, poison ivy, and uh, this is uh, the last part is for the decompressor because being so diffuse, being so easy to detect, the attacker in the past decided to use encryption to protect the the, the, the portable executable uh, uh, for, for for Yara. So this is when you look into uh, the code of in, in execution in memory because obviously you can now uh, even go into this thanks to Yara. So. This is the formalization process for the actionable IOCs. Uh, we collect atomic IOCs, then we go for classification and attribution based of, out of a number of checks, especially the Yara rule related to this configuration of the, the, the string of presented into the portable executable, but also we used to work into the packet analysis. Um, so. Yara can help also digging into the pickups. So if you create a single Yara that is able also to look into the pickups with a proper uh, type of uh, approach, you can continue to keep one, everything in one single Yara, ruling also the communication. So even in case where you can't find immediate feedback out of the Yara description, the, the, the Yara, the, the, the aspect of the portable executable, you can still identify the attacker and that particular type of version thanks to the fact that the, the, the stream of communication continue to be almost the same. Um, and obviously other items that we keep into our analysis is a number of other items like uh, artifacting system, uh, mutex, for example, uh, stuff that is obviously dynamic, so it's not more into the Yara to look for, but still we can have sandboxes to have that, or debugging, or other way to, to check, and still having the chance to identify this version is linked to that particular attacker, that particular campaign. Another one that is uh, an example is a Trojan Bisonal. Bisono is a backdoor, and uh, it's mainly separated in two parts. One part is the main module that is the center of the entire uh, set of capabilities, the, the, the center, the core of the, of the malware. But the most important aspect is the communication module. In this particular case, um, 
The communication gives us visibility upon a number of parameters that are important to attribute the attack on Bisonal 2 and obviously behind that to the Chinese APT group that is behind Bisonal. So we normally do that by, even in this case, having the chance to look at traffic. The traffic is extremely peculiar in a way that it contains situ domain information, flags, and information about the host where Bisonal is running. Okay? Even in a case where it's slightly obfuscated, you can easily identify this parameter as a potential good item to develop your own to identify the Bisonal traffic. Um, the resulting is a description of a number of different things that are uh, useful for identifying and attributing Bisonal into an environment. So from the type of malware that is a modular Trojan in one single stage, however, uh, to the beaconing capability, the port listening, the dissemination strategy, the type of client-server communication that is mainly HTTP and HTTPS, and uh, a number of other items like the you can see here. One second. You, you can see, oh, there's a pointer. Here, this is for, you know, just a second. I will, eh, this flag. This flag identify uh, the specific victim. In specific, they were coding a number of code into this that we define by uh, investigation were behaving for differently because they were in different environment. So we find this one on an environment, study it. Obviously, at the first time, it was not giving us much visibility upon anything. On a second check on a different environment, we identified that these parameters were different, and we started to understand that this flag was basically saying this is one customer, one victim, this is another victim, and we compare this with others that we have collected from public uh, sources, and we identify others uh, flags that were belonging to other companies. So from that perspective, uh, looking at this is again very, very useful. Okay, so uh, we also generate some IOCs out of the behavior, of the, out of the analysis, by detonating samples into um, sandboxes, for example. And so we have been able to identify IOCs for the registry value uh, or the type of file created that were almost the same in, in general for the sim same segment of time. So they run multiple campaigns, but in the segment of two, three months, normally the name of the um, of the executable, the one that is dropped and executed, it was al almost the same. So this is this is uh, the, the the Yara generated out of all these analysis. Um, you know, from the perspective of the situation where you don't have the chance to integrate one single Yara having just a generic expression, you can go for the super rule. Super rule is still a one Yara, but in this super rule you contain different rules. So in this case, for example, we define a different campaign for the same attacker coming from, you know, these are the flags. So by, by this you can even running through the packets, these type of things, you can understand who is the victim of, with, with a match to the Yara, okay? Okay. You do, Aranda? No, okay. So, uh, we don't finish with Yara and with Frack and Rift. We use also, we have defined to use also uh, Claim IV. Uh, Claim IV is an antivirus, okay? So everybody think about this like, a, you know, open source, uh, uh, free to use antivirus, not really powerful, not really, you know, into the competitive chance against the, the challenger. I mean, it's not a challenger of, of, of a corporate solution like McAfee or whatever. This is true, true. Of, of, however, we think about Claim IV in a different way. Being an open source code, being open to uh, evolu evolutions, uh, Claim IV integrate Yara, for example. Claim IV integrate the chance to develop 
custom signature that the others, as uh, Kevin anticipated, uh, are not really open to do. So in our massive triage environment, uh, one environment evilly compromised where there are heterogeneous systems and where we need to have the capability to run IOCs or actionable IOCs, we need to have a platform that give us this chance. And the platform is, is a Claim IV. Claim IV came from in, in, in package that uh, includes a, a, ver a virus scanner, a common line virus scanner, a client server virus scanner, so you can run a server pointing to share to, to folders and ask him to, to scan, go for update of the virus definition database easily. So from the perspective of um, IR, it's a good product. I mean, it's definitely useful, uh, especially when you are investigating upon Unix systems that are not covered by vast majority of the platforms, uh, the IR platform the, to, today. So, yeah, um, basically, Clam IV is a sort of integration of all that we have discussed before into a platform that can help us solving the incident. There are, it has also other features like the quarantine. We don't discuss about this because in terms of IR, forensic, quarantine is a risky beast. But that said, it's still a chance, especially when you are looking for ransomware stuff that is not really, really important in the end of, in, in terms of IR or, you know, uh, coverage of protection uh, of, of um, uh, attacks from uh, advanced adversaries. But still, it's a chance. So, in the end, Yara is the Swiss Army knife to create actionable IOCs. Claim IV is the uh, right hand for Yara to be able to to, to search these actionable IOCs in the in environment. So as Stefano was saying is is that um we, we've just found Clam AV a awesome tool for scanning multiple machines. Uh, it, it does take a little bit of time. Depends on you know how big those hard drives are. If we're if we're talking two or three terabyte, it could be anywhere from uh, an hour or two uh, to a couple of days. You know, depends on uh, systems and all that. Yeah. Seven. Yes. Yes. Now, when you're talking, is that something you're seeing live as you're scanning then, and then you're trying to act accordingly, or is there something you're doing in analysis? Well, this is... I don't want to push products into presentation, but we have a solution that is basically RSA-based, uh, produce it, uh, that is collecting all the traffic in the environment when we resolve incidents, okay? It, it's massive. I mean, it generates every type of uh, meta out of the packets, but it, it, it can also give you the packets. So when you collect this, you collect the packets you are suspecting that are interesting, you can run the YAR upon. So if you have a good actionable IOC upon the packet side, you can immediately identify occurrences that are matching poisonality in the case. Okay, and then you can expand the uh, visibility upon this traffic uh, configuring specific set of rule even for the RSA product to be able to quickly identify other occurrences. But for the most part, we're we're searching what's on hard drive. Yeah. So, but you know, this is all part of a layered process for doing uh, IR. This is just one aspect. Now, when we go to scan um, for badness, uh, basically. Uh, this is what those command lines are going to look like. Um, you know, as we're just looking for the infected, we want incursion. So we want to make sure we start at, uh, you know, if it's a Unix drive, slash, or the C drive, C colon. We want to do all matches for our rules because 
the more times we see a hit on a particular file, the greater we can determine it's most likely bad, because sometimes we get false positives. The other thing that's really nice about uh, Clam AV, it'll, it will search archives. And we will see actors use RER, zip, um, tar files, what have you. And to be able to search those files for our signatures, I mean, Yara doesn't do it by itself. So, you know, Clam AV and Yara uh, really works out for us. And then for uh, the database, this is where our custom signatures are. And then where our starting point is for uh, Clam AV to start. So usually we recommend the very root of the drive and, you know, like the C colon uh, start of, uh, for Windows. And then we want to make sure that we capture all of the output into a file so we can view it later. I like using T if, if I have that available because then I can see it's processing and then it's still capturing the output. Now to run Yara rules, everything uh, everything else is the same, but we're going to have uh, a list of Yara signatures uh, versus the uh, Clam AV database. And this is what this is going to look like as far as Clam AV hits for our signatures. You know, here's our files that it matched on. Here is what uh, the string we uh, set in the database what it's for. So I have pretty good certainty that this uh, KSwap D0 is a CPU miner of some sort. Now it may not be this exact version, um, just depends on how good your signatures are or how generic uh, you've written them. This is what a Yara uh, rules is gonna look like. Mm -hmm. Same sort of thing, um, it's, it's searched all these files, uh, and we have uh, just some generic hits. Now, I've, now we'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but I find Yara's great for small signatures versus the Clam AV where we can string a bunch of things together. So uh, yeah. but we'll cover that in a little bit. Yeah, so uh, the the good thing about ClamIV, I told you, is the chance to create a database of signatures or integrate new signatures into a database, like the one that is publicly available. Um, the chance to create rules is based on Psych2. Psych2 is part of the uh, ClamIV uh, project, but uh, need to be downloaded separately and need to be used accordingly. I mean, with a little bit of exposure to, to, the, to the, the way the, the rules are being created and, 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 and so saved onto the databases. So we can generate custom signatures out of atomic IOCs like MD5 or SHA-1 ashes uh, simply by uh, looking through SEC2 into the, uh, the the file, or we can use the scripter-like uh, section in the uh, ash sections into the uh, packet executable, or structure, precise structure in terms of exe uh, expression into, into the file itself. So it's pretty flexible and really useful. Uh, one just minimum step back, think about it, you are investigating a very complex environment, about 80, 90, Turin? Uh, that was, uh, that's a couple hundred. Yeah, couple hundred thousand <laughs> systems. And uh, out of them, there were about 2,400 Unix system, like AX, that no solution have to cover, right? Yeah, HPUX, so you name it, they have it. There was an investigation covering the Zwift, the Zwift uh, ACE, you know, uh, in one of the many banks <laughs> that were having problem with this. So, uh, 
there was no solution to investigate that unless you put something out of your bag that is good to run in these systems. And we use this, exactly this. We generate a number of ICs. We created, uh, we take the previous invest investigation of the same incident with us. And in this case, Claim AV was our solution. Really, I mean, uh, compared to the chance to uh, make manual analysis, it speed up the process at, at least 100 times. We solved the bot in 20 days. So, anyway, uh, this is how the signature can be created. You can basically use SEC2 and you express the minus minus MD5, in case you want the MD5 hash, of the executable and uh, throw this into a database. Okay? Generate the proper string and you can then check uh, what is into the sign file. This is the entry. Look, the name of the file, the indicator, uh, I mean, this is um, uh, an, um, an ID, and this is the string generated. So, that's good, it's easy. I mean, once you have a number of items already discovered since the beginning of the incident, you can immediately create a number of uh, entries in the database and plug this into the uh, ClamIV database or create a separate database just for you. I mean, depends on you. Uh, in our case, we used to integrate our stuff into the generic database just to have also matching of anything that was malicious uh, from the past, not related to this attack, but in the uh, database of ClamIV. Um, obviously, you can save in different type of format the uh, the rule. I mean, the um, the SIG, the SIG2 uh, entry. Uh, I told you, depending on the type of thing. One question, the one aspect that uh, Kevin has already highlighted is that you can inspect archives. You can also investigate stuff like that file or, you know, uh, not necessarily executable or not necessarily executable that appears to the system at the beginning as executable. That's, that's important. Um, there is also the chance, I told you, to create um, a rule based on the base, or at the body of the file. I mean, a certain set of uh, elements into the file, uh, set, a certain set of strings into the file that are hexadecimal strings, you can use that to create an entry. So even this is good. Obviously, with Claim IV, we lose the chance to investigate the network. This is just for Yara. But everything else, we can cover with that. So. In terms of uh, what we spoke, the trinity of the IR, meaning the visibility upon system, network, and logs, Clam IV solved the system visibility, while Yara solved the network visibility in this case. Okay? Okay. I pass again. Okay. So uh, this is a, a graphical method of generating signatures. So if you have IDA and it's uh, version 6.x, uh, this works out pretty good. Um, there's the Clam V uh, signature creator. Basically, um, come down here, install it like you would any other IDA uh, plugin, and then you're going to open up the binary in IDA and uh, to open up the uh, screens, uh, I'm sorry, the, the uh, uh, strings. And then from there, you're going to start highlighting anything that makes sense for a signature. You want to keep it somewhat generic, but you want to keep it uh, so that you know you're not just going to hit on every single file. So in this particular crypto miner, for example, you can see I have pool uh, uh, mine mr. Dot com. I have stratum, uh, TCP, minergate, and nicehash.com. So, you know, a very simple uh, 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 select strings. And these strings actually hit on several different types of miners. So, again, we're getting into this action IOCs. We're not st uh, stricking. So, if you can see up here, the the uh, the line I didn't highlight is a very unique string to this binary, but it's not actionable, actionable IOC. 
And it's only going to hit on this particular barney. So we want something uh, a little more generic. So after you uh, highlight those, you're going to right click and uh, add string to Clam AV Creator, which will give you this. And you can see what you selected here. Then uh, that you know this brings up another little sub panel uh, with a list of all the uh, strings. I don't have a screenshot of that, um, but when you're ready to cr actually create your string, you're going to select the uh, strings that uh, you're interested in for the signatures, and uh, cl click the Create Clam AV Signature button, which gives you this window here that pops up. And in here, you're going to highlight this and copy that to a text file and that's starting your database. Yeah. So, you know, we, we talked about uh, um, how, how you're going to, uh, uh, using Clam AV to scan. This is one example of using PS Exec to scan your Windows machines. Um, you know, just your typical PS exec uh, command line, username, password for the admin account, and then uh, where the location of the database is, and, or, you know, down here is a, is a full example here. And, uh, you know, you're going to try to do this as centrally as possible. Yeah. Now, we had talked about FRAC in the beginning of this, and I, I said we could use FRAC to retrieve files to start a triage. Well, you can also use FRAC technically to run any command you want on a remote machine. So in this particular case, I'm using FRAC to run Clam AV on all of the uh, remote machines in the environment. And it just goes through by IP and uh, kicks it off. Um, one in it. The other thing that I probably didn't touch on in the beginning, it does track those IP addresses that, for whatever reason, didn't respond. So you'll get us, you'll get a list of those that all you have to redo. You take that uh, the output of here, the failed ones, and just put the that list in to the IP list uh, there, and it will scan those again. The the uh, the one other thing I am going to suggest is if you decide to go with this method for FRAC, um, you should be able to do more than 25 boxes at a time. And it's configurable within there. There's a config.ini. If you uh, there's the documents are up there. They're completely document the whole tool. But uh, you know, try it out in in your environment uh, with a small subset of boxes to make sure that uh, your network can handle it. So initially, uh, we're when we're using FRAC to uh, retrieve files and all that, we keep that under 25 because having it tried to do 50 to 100 uh, didn't really make the tool go any faster and there's impact to the network. Uh, but as far as Clam AV goes, there's not a whole lot of impact because it's running locally on the box and it's just sending the output uh, to your network share. So you should be able to run a lot more than that. Yeah, coming back to the Poison Ivy, uh, these are uh, another notation, another expression of the Yara um, for Poison Ivy that is basically run the same set we have developed it into Clam AV. Um, and uh, you can easily understand, compared to the previous uh, slide related to the Yara, that this is basically an import of the Yara into Clam IV. Um, and uh, this one, instead, is a notation for Clam IV uh, rule related to Bisonal that we have discussed before. Um, in this case, we have been able also to track certain type of items, oh, sorry, wait, okay. Certain type of items into, into the, um, the PA that is related also to the behavior, like, like this, okay. This is related to the fact that the file will drop 
the uh, persistent me mechanism through uh, executing a key in the run on system. So we have been able to implement also this into the description of the rule into the claim IV. So meaning that claim IV is also able to catch the chance of this particular type of key running in the system while drop the file and execute it. So that's good. So one other thing that uh, in a recent triage case I was doing, yeah, I was using Clam AV and basically I had loaded all of the um, signatures the, um, uh, from ClamV that I could and I ran it across the entire drive. And this is just kind of a side note for y'all. ClamAV was able to detect um, uh, basically uh, exploits and stuff sitting in logs. But yeah, I, it, this was just kind of floored me because I never saw, I never knew that Clam AV would do this. <laughs> and so this ModSec audit log, for example, it, it's literally mod security log. We have a post request, and and this is regarding Windows, and we have the cert util URL catch trying to download a piece of malware, and uh, Clam AV saw that in the log. It made my job easier. So rather than parsing through a bunch of logs and looking at every single thing, which could take hours, you know, uh, just run it real quick and take a quick look at it. Um, and and the, the section down here, that is what was in the log. So it was a bunch of URL encoding and stuff like that, but this is what the, uh, the ASCII output of that um, command that was being ran against the, uh, uh, the web server. So uh, just to summarize a little bit, in the beginning of the presentation, we talked about um, what action IOCs are, and we want to make sure that we have solid indicators. Now, uh, we talked about RIF and FRAC in the beginning, and that's just part of initiating the triage process when responding to an incident. We need to get files from our, our boxes uh, that we're going to analyze, uh, looking for our first couple threads with the incident. And then once we have those first few threads that uh, we're able to pull, then we can start bringing in Clam AV, for example, and start uh, taking those actional IOCs and creating signatures and start searching for all the other machines uh, within the environment. So there, you know, the uh, let's say the first wave of uh, uh, triage gives us maybe uh, ten machines when we take those IOCs, run them through Clam EV, we may have, you know, 20, 30 more. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it depends on what we find with those 20, 30 more, if we have more IOCs, and then we'll do another wave with Clam EV. But the nice thing is, is nobody has to sit there and uh, be hands on keyboard for the entire scan. You scan and then you analyze. And if we're only getting uh, our hits back and just doing a quick review of that, uh, you're talking anywhere from five minutes to maybe an hour to go through output of you know, uh, 10,000, 20,000 machines, no problem, versus having somebody log in and then look for them by hand. Um, no, no, I mean, the, the, this one is for posterity. The, this is uh, thinking about where we're heading. We are increasing the number of, uh, thank you, the number of um, items we consider into the actionable IOCs. So we are expanding, even uh, looking to the chance to integrate suricatas, no rule, and other things, just in order to provide in potentially a single set of platform, a single small set of platform, even open source or potentially free, the chance to run biggest investigation than than normally th thought. Okay, so uh, and, and this is really really important. On the other end, uh, consider the fact that. 
even if actually the technology is moving to help support with new uh, new platforms the IR uh, from the host perspective from the network perspective many of the uh, vast majority of these uh, are not interested in developing agents because normally they are agent based on system like HPUX so we think that our approach will stay forever because simply is uh, easy, uh, relatively low impact in terms of uh, you know resources to to use, and in the end, it's also potentially, if well designed in the in uh, in the begin at the beginning, really really performing. So, I mean, from from that perspective, is definitely a winning solution. Thank you very much, guys. Do you have any question? Do you have any question? Uh, one thing I'll say too is if you search for my name in Google um, under the SANS blog, I have a bunch of articles um, that I'm in the process of writing. There's probably four or five right now talking about mass triage and the tools that we use. Not And so the tools that I go through on the SANS site is open source. And I go through our methodology. And it's, it's nothing that, uh, you know, everybody can do it. It's fairly easy. Uh, it's just learning the tools on, and how to do that. And that feeds these IOCs here. Thanks. Thanks.